Hello, my name is Mr. Chipman, and I teach biology, AP biology at Murray, Kentucky, Murray High School in Murray, Kentucky. This is 1.11 Food Chains Food Webs. We're looking at AP environmental science today, and let's look at these things. Just as an aside note, if you just search food chains and food webs, you're going to be blessed with the myriad pictures that are just some of them outlandish. To say <laughs> Anyway, sorry for the side note there. Food chain, very simple, linear sequence of organisms that's showing one path for the energy flow, right? The grasshopper eats the foxtails. The mice eats the grasshopper. Mice, mouse. The raccoon eats the mouse. The hawk eats the raccoon. Even though it looks like the hawk is going for the mushrooms here, it's not. The mushrooms are should be arrows be pointing all of it right because mushrooms are fungi and fungi are decomposers and so what this is showing you is that like Mufasa taught us long ago is that the zebra eats the grass and then we eat the zebra and then we become the grass right this is just showing you that this this energy flow ends up kind of cycling through an ecosystem decomposers returning those nutrients and energy not energy those nutrients to the ecosystem but this is just showing a single sort of chain of that. We can do better than this, right? So here's a food web. A food web is showing all of the interactions in a community. The community represents all the living things in an ecosystem, right? And so this shows all the interactions. The rattlesnake is eating the rabbit, the kangaroo rat, and the tarantula, right? The hawk is eating the rabbit, lizard, and grasshopper. And the bacteria is eating all of it. It's the, it's the king of the, of the desert biome food web, right? And so you, you, this, is, this gives us a better picture of what's going on in this particular ecosystem and also shows us the importance of one particular organism over another, right? I mean, you can see here that if you took rabbits out of this equation, this ecosystem's really going to struggle, right? Shows you the importance of the ecosystem, Typically at the bottom, you're going to have your producers and, you know, you're going to have your primary, secondary. But it also shows you that those are not like hard and fast rules, right? Um, and, I, and I think that's important, too. Sometimes secondary consumers dabble in the producers as well. So it's not like they're just eating primary consumers. And I think that's important. You know, when you see something like this trophic level thing, it makes you sort of want to believe this progression that sparrows are only eating primary consumers. And that may be the case. But, and but rats are a great example of this. Rats are omnivorous. They'll eat anything they can get their hands on, right? So sometimes uh, these levels don't always tell the full story. But I think it is important to put this sort of pyramid onto this picture, right, to understand that while this food web is a little more loose, it still represents these trophic levels. It represents those energy transfers, decrease in biomass as you get to the top, decrease in energy as you get to the top, the importance of the producer level, and, and so forth. Don't want to skip one. So this brings us to this idea of two feedback loops that you find in nature. One of them is called a positive feedback loop. So we teach feedback loops in the biology classroom, and so I, I don't want there to be any confusion here. A positive feedback loop in nature is essentially when one change causes another change that sort of loops back and exacerbates the original change or makes it worse, right? This picture is kind of an example of that. So back in yonder days, there was this nice balance between wolves and elk and trees right? The wolves were killing enough elk to let the trees sort of live a certain way. And there was this nice balance. Well, you take the wolves out. What happens? The elk are going to increase in population, which is going to decrease the um, trees, right? It's going to decrease the amount of food that's available. And then that goes back and exacerbates the problem that it becomes harder to introduce wolves into this population because the elk are now actually going to decrease because their food stores are also deplenished, right? They've deplenished their own food stores, and so they're unable to support their population. 
And so by reintroducing wolves to this population before that takes place, before the ecosystem collapses, you actually balance it out, which brings us to the negative feedback loop. A negative feedback loop is when a change causes something that will then in turn come back and balance out that original change, right? Um, boom bust cycle for predator prey is a great example, right? The predators, uh, there's a lot of prey in a, in a population, so there becomes more predators in that population. Because there's more predators, prey species decrease is the change that loops back and causes predators to balance out, decrease as well, which is going to cause an increase in prey populations. And this cycle sort of is a self-balancing mechanism, right? And so when you think of negative feedback, think of something that is sort of balancing itself out over time because one change causes a flip to the previous change, whereas a positive feedback is something that is, is not balancing but is getting worse. I think that's, that's an important distinction between those two. Here's a great example of this. So uh, cod fisheries off the Atlantic coast, North Atlantic in particular, um, overfishing occurred, right? Population of the world increased, fish are easy to catch, and so you go out and you get all the fish, and there aren't any fish left. And the fish that are left are having little cod babies. Now, what's the problem with this? The species that the cod used to prey upon, used to eat, there's so few cod that their prey species have increased. And guess what the prey species eat? They eat the baby codfish. And so codfish um, infants or codfish offspring are actually now being preyed upon by the thing that the codfish used to prey upon themselves. And so the elimination of the codfish is actually causing more decrease in codfish populations, right? They're unable to kind of self-correct because of this positive feedback. Because we overfish them, now they're unable to self-correct and it's a problem that's going to be difficult to sort of fix, right? Without changing some of those things from the outside. Let's look at a question. A student examines a food web in which a single species of insect is eaten by both small birds and frogs, which is the following, best describes this ecological interaction. So you have different trophic levels eating um, an insect, or it could be that small birds and frogs are on the same trophic level, we don't really know. It's a positive feedback loop, likely to stabilize both predator and populations. Energy from one trophic level is transferred to multiple higher levels. Insects acting as both producer and consumer, and the birds and frogs occupy the same trophic level as the insect. I'm going with B. Energy from one trophic level is transferred to multiple higher levels, right? Because the frog, the other one's positive feedback loop is not stabilizing. It's an unstabilizing thing. The insect is acting as, nope, that's not even close to true. Birds and frogs occupy the same. They do not uh, because they obviously occupy different trophic levels. And so here we have birds and frogs on different trophic levels, and that energy is being transferred to both of them. Hopefully this was helpful to you. I believe that's it on Unit 1, 1.11 over. Do well on your Unit 1 exam. Unit 2 coming up soon.